All right, so we're going to shift gears just a little bit or think something that maybe in some ways it feels like a gear shift, but really this is part of in the new norm, as Kim was talking about, where weed control is uh, more complicated. And we start talking about rotations and sequencing and, as you mentioned, record keeping. I think this is an important part to keep in the back of your mind as you are planning out your new and complicated, more maybe more complicated weed control or just rotating in different things. How do we keep our, our canola export ready? Uh, and so I'm going to talk specifically about uh, residues and um, international implications, the agreements you're signing with an elevator. There's all sorts of criteria in there. So how do we get the effective weed control that we need? That we've already heard some top tips from Kim and Rob. But how do we also make sure we're meeting all those requirements? When we go to sell our canola, it's good to go into the system. So first, a little background on why this is important. 90% of the canola that we are selling is gone. You probably know that. 90% is going to other countries, right? So not only do we have to worry with our own uh, rules and regulations here and growing the canola, but there's some rules and regulations in the countries we're exporting to and, you know, 90%, it's important, right? That's that's the market is we're, we don't have a lot of people in Canada, we're shipping the stuff somewhere else. So a lot of the work that the Canola Council focuses on, part of the work that I'm a part of is resolving and preventing uh, market access barriers. I highlighted preventing there. Ideally, if it's all going well, a lot of the work we're doing, the vast majority of the work we're doing is proactive, making sure that we can not have uh, market issues. So, you know, a new herbicide is registered or a new uh, or a rate change, something like that, something new is re registered. We try to have all of our export countries on board and on the same page as to what the residues look like. They're acceptable before it comes to the farmers, right? So when you get a new product, you can just use it. That doesn't always happen. Uh, and sometimes we'll talk, I'll talk a little bit about our keep it clean program and why we might have restrictions or we might have to have some more education, but the vast majority of the work we do is proactive so that we're trying to give farmers access to all the tools and make sure that uh, rules in other countries are not limiting our access to the tools to grow canola. Just a quick little overview again showing our canola goes a lot of places. So there's rules and, and different rules and regulations in every one of these countries. We can't satisfy all of these customers, but really the top five or six customers are really important. They're taking a lot of our canola. Uh, and so these are ones that we spend a lot of time working on as far as making sure that our rules and regulations are harmonized with them, or if not, that we have some sort of agreement in place. Um, I will talk about MRLs here kind of throughout this presentation, but just a quick background or a quick refresher. When I talk about MRLs, I'm talking about the maximum residue limit. So this is the amount of pesticide from a, a given product that we can be find detectable in our canola seed. You'll see down here at the bottom of this triangle, this is what we're talking about. The MRL is trade compliance, legal for trade. It's very safe for human health. So this could be an MRL in Canada, and obviously that's important, but also it could be an MRL in a different country. Um, and again, just for reference, or if you're talking to consumers or this comes up, when we're talking about like safety, as far as human safety, we're talking much higher rates. These are much lower. So when we're talking MRLs, we're talking trade compliance. We're not talking human health or safety, you know, to be exceeding an MRL in a country, it could still very safe. It's still very safe for human health if we're just talking a small exceedance here. So we're talking these really low levels. We're talking parts per million. Um, so again, really low levels of pesticides that can make it through and be tested. Uh, so just a little bit of something on why, you know, we, we've talked more about this. MRLs have been, I think, a bigger conversation. If you asked 10 years ago, you know, you might have heard maybe one presentation, you might not have heard any presentations on it. Now it's a bigger thing and we keep hearing that it's going to become more important. So, so why is that? We used to have well, a couple points. One, we used to have a codex. We still have codex, this regulatory body that was globally around and that kind of people would, we would, that would set out a standard and then all the countries would adopt the codex standard. That was kind of the golden dream of this product. So we'd only have one number. We talked about an MRL for a certain pesticide in canola. We would have one number globally. You meet that standard ship anywhere. Now, CODIS has had some problems. Uh, and so a lot of countries have gone to making their own standards. And so, and some countries will then reference other country standards. So we have a number of different standards out there. Some people still use CODEX. You might have a CODEX MRL and an MRL in the EU, and they're different. Um, also, residue testing has become much more uh, inexpensive and sensitive. So testing is happening very regularly on, on shipments going into these countries, and it's extremely sensitive. There's some other hazard-based versus risk-based approach. Um, lots of work on how do you set those MRLs. Again, we're talking areas where it's all very safe for human consumption, but exactly how sensitive we set those. Um, and, and some 
countries were under a lot are under uh, some scrutiny as far as sensitivity from the public. The public cares a lot more about what's in their food, what pesticides are in their food, um, and they don't always realize that, that there are not necessarily human health considerations here. That we're talking exceptionally low levels, and at the parts per million or parts per billion, man, there's a lot of things you can find. You know, and previously we just couldn't test for that. So an example of what that this what this would look like. Um, so clethodim. Classic uh, canola herbicide, got to get those wild oats. Ideally, maybe you're rotating as we heard some things, but you know, you're know you going to be applying some clethodim. In Canada, we have 0.05. Uh, in Codex, they're actually changing it. So you can see a 0.5 here, but it's a higher level right now. In the EU, it's higher, um, higher in all these other countries. So that's a good thing. If, if Canada has the most conservative MRL, when we go to export, if it meets Canada's Canadian standards, we're good when we go to export it. You also see here a couple of these have processing MRL. So sometimes uh, herbicide pesticides, some of these things will concentrate in the oil or the meal. So sometimes we have to be a little aware of that. But you can see here the, uh, yeah, there's a couple of things showing up. The EU is looking to change their MRL. Codex is looking to change. So these, these are some of the things we're monitoring. And this is why it gets complicated. A lot of the proactive work we're doing is trying to harmonize these MRLs, or at least if we can't harmonize them, we make sure that they're somewhat aligned with Canada. So when we go to export, we don't have problems entering the global marketplace. Um, so again, our, our, our customers, these countries are our customers and they have different needs, they have different regulations. We have a great reputation, but we gotta continue to meet that. And as they change their, uh, the goalposts just a little bit, or say change some of the regulations, we have to be on top of that, uh, working with them proactively to make sure that they uh, fit and are, work well with Canadian canola. So just an example, uh, we have various meetings that we meet across. We meet with grain handlers, we meet with companies that are registering pesticides, and we meet with exporters. Um, so in this year alone, there was 26 MRL changes in key markets. So one of the top five markets we sell canola to. So big countries that we sell canola to and products that have a lot of uh, acres. So we're talking at least 20,000 or 200,000 acres across Western Canada. So products you're probably familiar with, 26 MRL changes in the global marketplace. Most of these were good, some, or some of these were sidelined, maybe harmonizing, maybe moving positively. Um, but these are the kind of things we're monitoring and working on all the time. Um, we have roughly uh, 20 missing MRLs for important herbicides. So a country that doesn't necessarily have it, they, if they don't have it, sometimes they'll just adopt the codex, that international standard, which is great. But again, we have lots of work to do. This number is slowly creeping down, um, but this is a lot of our work encouraging countries to register pesticide, uh, get MRLs in place domestically, or if they don't have that, make sure that they're going to go to uh, to use Codex. And then we review pesticides of concern, where an MRL is changed, we go, well, that's lower than Canada. Is that a problem? Is there actual residue in the products? Lots of our products don't have residue. It's really, really low. So again, we work with the registrants, we work with the canola industry, the exporters, sometimes the other countries, working on making sure that there's no hiccups. So once you get to sell your canola, we are good. So that's kind of the background to why this is important. And this is getting to be a bigger and bigger issue. So as farmers, as agronomists, as people on the ground, what, uh, what can you do? That's gonna be the back half of my presentation. here. So the, one of the most important things is using those pe acceptable pesticides. It has to be registered on the crop. So where you go to your crop protection guide, as Kim was talking about the weed book, you have to make sure that that's registered for canola. That's key. If, if it's not registered for canola, I guaranteed we don't have the proper MRLs in place in other countries, and they will be testing for random other, they have a whole suite of pesticides they test for. And if it's not registered in Canada, we haven't done that proactive work to make sure we have an MRL in place in those markets. And then we have, we run into big problems. So we're talking about using registered pesticides. Um, registered in Canada, that means that we've done some work to make sure it's gonna be, unless we've given some sort of specific awareness or notice out to the industry, we've done some work internationally to make sure that 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 works. And then the, the second one is using them correctly. So, you know, you have a registered pesticide, but we need to be using the correct rate and the correct timing. Both of those are critical on what the actual residue is. And so the data that we work with is if you apply the highest or the, the correct rate, so whatever's on the label, that highest rate, and you apply it at the any time in that window, it's going the residue is going to be acceptable. We can work with that. That's what kind of what we've built. We've done all that proactive work on. So if you need more information on that, the spray to swath calculator, it's quick, type in your pesticide and it'll tell you how far back from uh, swathing or from combining you need to work. Now with some of our herbicides, it's not always the biggest deal, but again, if you're going with a late application of something worth checking, uh, especially insects, you get a random late season insect outbreak, grasshoppers, and you haven't seen grass, I haven't sprayed for grasshoppers in 10 years. 
and you go to get something out of the shed or you go to your retail and you pick up something, this can be some pretty significant difference uh, pre-harvest intervals between like 24 hours or three days, which isn't too bad, up to 21 days. And that can get pretty close at the end there. So making sure that anytime you're picking up something in your shed before it gets in your sprayer, make sure that pre-harvest interval works so that the residues are gonna be fine uh, once it leaves the farm. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about glyphosate. Glyphosate uh, is the poster child for a lot of things. It's the most used chemist, uh, herbicide in Western Canada. Uh, globally, there's a lot of scrutiny under it. Uh, and we use it, it, we use it a lot in canola production, right? We're, depending on what kind of canola, you might have a couple different herbicide passes. Hopefully you're tank mixing something else now for some better IPM, but we're gonna be using, so getting that timing right is really critical with glyphosate, especially that pre-harvest interval. 50 to 60% seed color change, really important. With glyphosate, with some pesticides, applying too late means that we get higher residues. With glyphosate, it's actually a bit the opposite. We don't, because glyphosate translocates so well, we want to make sure that plant is far enough along that only that only a little bit of glyphosate is going to make it to the seed. If we apply too early, we're going to get really high residues. Um, and then, so that's pretty straightforward. Swathing timing, we're pretty good at staging our canola, and you want to get it right for weed control. It's good for agronomy. It's good for that. The other thing is, in this case, if you have a field like this, what do you do? How do you stage this field? It's got a bit of this going that. It's obviously not a pre-harvest timing, but it's not very uniform. So again, we're talking the least mature parts of those so especially in a year like this guy obviously had some uh, probably a drill problem or something, some depth, something going on. Or this year where we had uh, quite a bit of drought, the canola was here, there, and everywhere. Again, we might have to manage areas of that field differently, but we have to be, but if we're going to try to uh, manage one field as a whole unit, we're looking at that least mature part. Because again, those residues can get really high really quickly. Um, so I guess a couple things on the Keep It Clean program. We are fortunate again this year to not have any major pesticides on our do not use. Uh, previously, we've talked about quinclorac. It was registered in Canada, but we didn't want, we couldn't use it because we didn't have MRLs in place. We are fortunate again this year to have MRLs in place for all of the rest, registered in-crop pesticides, which is a great place to be. Um, the only one that I'll keep on, and we've had, we've talked about this for years, is keeping malathion out of your bins for storage, right? You can't treat your bins with malathion and then store canola in there. Um, Again, not a huge issue. We don't run into a lot of problems, but again, malathion is not registered for that. So we don't have MRLs in place. So we can get detects and we do occasionally get the odd detect on this. So just something to keep in mind. If, you're, if you have bin problems, you you're treating bins, you had some insect problems or something, make sure those bins are marked. They don't go to canola. Um, but other than that, we're fortunate again this year to not have any products on our registry. So just a quick summary of the things I talked about. We have no product, product restrictions for 2022. More countries are using their own MRL standards. That, that is a growing trend. Um, and they're testing more often and they're testing, they have very sensitive testing. So any little bits of uh, residue that's not accounted for, they will find. So applying a registered pesticide at the right rate at the right time has never been more critical. As you're, And I know it's complicated as your weed control program is getting more complicated with tank mix partners. The amount of active ingredients you're applying is probably skyrocketing but it's really critical that record keeping uh, and just checking to make sure the rate right, right rate and the right time is really, really critical. I think I'll uh, end there. Right on. Thanks, Ian.